Welcome to another episode of the Middle East News Hour. Um, over the past couple of years, actually, or more, uh, we've heard more and more reports about uh, actions taken by Israeli Arabs that are nationalistic in their character and um, rebellious. Uh, we saw a spasm of violence. Uh, it wasn't really a spasm, but open, organized cooperation among Israeli Arabs and Hamas uh, in uh, May 2021 during the Guardian of the Walls operation against Hamas in Gaza. We saw riots, organized riots by Arab Israelis in mixed Arab Jewish towns throughout the country, lynching of Jewish Israelis by their Arab neighbors, the burning of Jewish businesses by Arabs uh, in, uh, in uh, Arab Israeli towns. We saw takeovers of uh, of a uh, highway uh, arteries, uh, traffic arteries throughout the country by rioting Arab Israelis. Um, and um, then in May 2021, uh, Yair Lapid and Naftali Bennett and Benny Gantz formed a government with the Muslim Brotherhood Party in the, in the Knesset uh, Ram. And uh, we've seen other things. But one of the people who has been uh, talking about something new uh, happening in the Israeli Arab uh, uh, community happening uh, new and bad is uh, is a uh, reserved is re or retired uh, brigadier general FEA Tom and he's my guest today uh, on the news hour and we're going to talk about uh, what he sees happening among Israeli Arabs and and what it all means uh, going forward into the elections and then uh, into the uh, coming year and uh, years to come so uh, first of all without further ado uh, FEA Tom thank you very much for joining me this week on the news hour Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> well, it's a really a pleasure. Um, I, uh, I, I, you spoke. Uh, I think it was last week. Uh, you gave a warning. You said, and not for the first time. You said it last week, last year as well, that what you're seeing happening on the ground is that Israeli Arabs are actually um, building an army. Uh, under our noses. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, or a lot, in fact, about what it is that you see and why it is that you concluding that what you're seeing indicates that they're building an army? I think that we have to look at the model of uh, the buildup of the uh, State of Israel uh, and um, far beyond that, the IDF, its armed forces at the beginning of the uh, establishment of the State of Israel. And I think that in many other areas, they are following the uh, steps of uh, Zionist movement in its very beginning. Uh, uh, and they follow these steps in order to uh, defeat Zionism and the State of Israel uh, uh, by using its own uh, weapons, if we can use these words. First, uh, the motivation. The motivation uh, is there uh, combined of, out of two main uh, sources, roots, ideological sources. One come from the Islamic part of the uh, Arab society, which uh, turned to be very strong. If uh, I try to remember the number of mosques, the number of women with the uh, burqa, and the uh, uh, use of uh, 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 religious Islamic terminology among the Israeli Arabs, let's say 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, <clears throat> everyone who has open ears, open eyes, <clears throat> understand that the uh, Islamic argumentation, the Islamic terminology and epistemology turned to be uh, the main tool and the leading voice amongst the Israeli Arabs uh, uh, and those who had any hopes out of creating a barrier against radicalism by the face of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, intellectual and uh, <clears throat> academic education uh, happened to be very uh, wrong and disappointed because uh, on the contrary, those who are most more highly educated and more uh, uh, sophisticated and more open <coughs> to, to the uh, <coughs> sorry voices coming out of the uh, uh, out of the 
uh, society out of the uh, uh, Arab society here in Israel, they realized that academic education, not only they didn't create a barrier, but appeared to be an accelerator uh, uh, to those kind of uh, uh, Islamic uh, radicalism. Uh, and, and this is one source. Israel is- can I, ask you, can I ask you just one question about what you were saying? Because it seems to me that there are, are two aspects of motivation. One is Islamic, like you said, and the no, other so one- I, I'm coming to this, you're is, right. One is Islam. Because, and the other one is coming from the West by the legitimation of a national state in general and the national state, uh, <clears throat> the state of Israel in specific. And this liberalism, progress, progressivism, joining hands with radical Islam to delegitimate the state of Israel uh, this, th those are the main two sources while the motivation is coming and reinforced now more than ever by the uh, combination of those two uh, uh, streams. And in an odd way, which is needed more time to, uh, to explain, it's the uh, campuses and the liberal academic liberalism and progressivism coming from the West, especially uh, 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 from America now, uh, uh, and the radical Islam are creating a perfect storm as far as the motivation, the hope, and the justification of delegitimate the state of Israel as the major frame through which we all uh, are supposed uh, to live and, and, uh, and to cooperate through. So this is the motivation. Now, uh, the 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 other the other the other level is the organization. I mean, you can have a motivation, but you don't have an organization. And people say, okay, they might not like us, they might hate the state of Israel, they might delegitimate the state of Israel, but they don't have the organization, the units, the frames to organize themselves through uh, a military uh, uh, effective activity. And again, a great mistake. Uh, the organizations <clears throat> are there far before the State of Israel was established. These, those are the chamulas, the families, the tribes, uh, which uh, were functioning as the units in the, uh, in the uh, great rebel of the Arabs against the British in the, in the 30s. And then they were the most effective uh, 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 units, or uh, I would say, uh, yes, units and organizations through which uh, they uh, uh, carried out the military and, 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 and operational activity against the state of Israel in its very early days at the, day, at the, at the, at the independent war. And that have not disappeared. We have to remember that the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of those people are sitting on the knees of their grandfathers and they hear uh, about the heroic war uh, that was, uh, uh, the, 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 the battle was, was lost and the Zionism was winning in the first round, but the motivation and the heritage of fighting and winning and carrying out the holy mission of destroying the state of Israel uh, and delegitimate de 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 its very existence is much stronger than all what Israel offered and might offer as far as standard of living, as far as infrastructure, as far as uh, uh, personal security. Uh, that is nothing and it's melt against this motivation and organizations through which the Hamul is turning to be uh, semi-military units. Now training, I mean, everyone remember that the Palmach and the Haganah, uh, uh, when they have been established at the very beginning, they needed to train. So they went to all kinds of uh, forests and remote places and trained themselves uh, while the British were here and it was 
illegal. They train themselves. Uh, everyone who traveled, especially at nights, in the Negev, in the Galilee, he can hear, uh, and this is my old uh, uh, soldier ear that can hear that it's not uh, uh, a fantasia, it's not a shooting in weddings just for kind of uh, uh, ritual purposes. It's training. They shoot, they use uh, weapons which were stolen in hundreds of thousands, especially from the IDF, but also smuggled through the, through the borders, not tanks, not Air Force yet. But if you think about how easy it is today to buy a drone and to fly it illegally, legally over the uh, airspace of Israel, you can understand that the day of having a uh, 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 vertical dimension, I would say, especially uh, drones uh, in, 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 in this uh, army, which is built now, is not very far. So uh, uh, the weapons are there, the units are there, motivation and heritage is there. And now you have to have many people who experience killing. Killing is something that normal people, normal citizens are not experienced and they are very much, uh, I would say, deterred from using power, especially killing. Because murdering is something that you don't do as a, as a, as a, as a um, normative, normative citizen and you might uh, suffer some uh, heavy punishments. But when you cross it, and not one or two or three or four, but thousands of people are involved in killing directly, indirectly, they support the murderers, then a society with the fear of killing, the fear of murdering, disappear. And when that disappear, you have a perfect soldier, is part of a unit, tribe, family, chamula, he is well equipped uh, with, with the up, up uh, state, state of the art. art, state of the art weapons, which were stolen directly from the hands of a modern army like the IDF. They are trained, they are committed, they experience killing. And, and then uh, immediately, not immediately, slowly, step by step, an army emerge because think about the Haganah, think about, about the Etzel and the Lehi. <clears throat> it was prepared in a cover, but at the moment it was needed, it's appeared as a very effective, trained, uh, well-equipped uh, 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 organization. That's what happened. Now, we have to remember that this kind of progress, this kind of process, the build up of this army enjoy also two more elements which may make it, a, 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 provide it a perfect kind of a cover. First, it's Israeli citizens. So they enjoy protections and innocence of being normative citizens. So everything is, <coughs> Everything they do fall first into the category of criminal activity. Uh, criminal activity means it's not a threat for the state. It's not a threat from the rule of law. It's not a mortal threat from the state to the state apparatus uh, 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 order. So it's very hard. You need a very comprehensive view and understanding of the phenomena in order to identify that an army is built. Citizens, they can be nervous, they can lose some control, they can kill some neighbors that they hate, but it's nothing which really represents a national problem, which needs entirely different approach and interference, both the police, the army, and the legal authorities uh, that represents something that a state uh, can can identify as a, as a 
as a national problem. This is one thing. And, 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 and it's, very, it's very important to understand that because of that, it's become a kind of, a, it's a kind of a threat, a kind of a problem that it's very hard to identify what the real potential of this uh, uh, to, to, to the very existence uh, uh, of the state of Israel. It's also enjoy uh, uh, a kind of uh, confusion who is about to deal with that, who is about to assess the progress and the threat coming out of that. It's not the army. It's also not the police because the police deal with criminals. The army these deals with external enemies. It could have been and should have been the Shabak, the uh, general security uh, uh, agency. Service. But the Shabak is so occupied with what happened in Judah and Samaria and what happened in Gaza. <clears throat> so they prefer uh, to, to ignore it. For many, many years, they prefer to ignore it uh, because they couldn't really uh, bring themselves into a, a, a mind state of telling the people in Israel, the leaders, the politicians, yes, uh, the idea of having the Israeli Arabs shifting into the democratic system and turning to be <clears throat> normative citizens in a democratic Jewish state failed. That is so bitter and so dramatic as far as the maybe the one of the most fundamental decisions that the state of Israel did after the independent war, other words, to provide all the Israeli Arabs who lived in Israel a uh, full uh, uh, civilian rights and hoping that along the time with high standard of living, with <clears throat> high uh, standard of civil rights, they will give up their uh, uh, destructive intentions as far as the long future of the state of Israel. And it's very hard to, to, to come and say it's failed. Uh, and we need, we need to tell ourselves the very truth. It's failed. And the greatest failure is, 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 is not that this army cannot be, you know, cannot be uh, defeated, and cannot be treated by the Israeli uh, defense forces. But the greatest failure is that this minority, and the experiment, the experience <clears throat> we launched when we established the state of Israel, telling the world and ourselves that yes, they are not Israelis, they are not they are, they are not Jewish, but they will turn to be very, uh, very uh, contributing uh, minority that can really enjoy full civilian rights. I think that what we see now. Uh, the narrative of we are Israeli Palestinians, which many, many years was not even mentioned. It was in the background, maybe something. Now it is said clear and loud, we are Israeli Palestinians. Other words, we represent the Palestinian dreams, intention, uh, interest uh, within the state of Israel, within its democratic, uh, uh, system, and no doubt that it brings the, the state of Israel, no matter if you are left or right, it brings the state of Israel as the uh, fulfillment of the Jewish people dream, desire, and request for having a state of their own, a national state of their own, uh, into, into a, a very uh, critical junction. We'll have to decide if we want a state of all its citizens or a Jewish state where some minorities can enjoy very high standard of living, very high standard of uh, civilian rights, 
uh, even even uh, personal security, but not and cannot be involved anymore as equals in the uh, in uh, determining what the future of the Jewish revolution, Jewish uh, 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 state will be. And you know, you're you're touching on something here, and obviously, what you're saying is extraordinarily disturbing. A little bit louder. Um, I said, obviously, what you're saying is very disturbing, um, and you're and you're touching on on something here that I think is um, it's it's being discussed not only in Israel but also in in other countries and in including in the United States. And our our colleague and and friend uh, Yoram Chazoni just wrote a new book called Rediscovering Conservatism, yeah. where he his argument basically, and, and I'm gonna have to have him on the show as well to talk about it, but essentially is that, you know, there is a national character to a state and that uh, the deal that in the United States in particular that conservatives made with, uh, with libertarians to try to um, build a big tent for, for conservative uh, uh, policy making really uh, handicapped it because the li libertarians came in and said, look, you know, so long as you're not bothering anybody, you can do whatever you want and we're not going to interfere. And what government has to do is leave, take itself leave, out of people's lives leave, leave. as much as possible. And and here, uh, and Israel also said, look, we, we give maximum uh, personal autonomy to our people you know, in whether it's in in free market uh, capitalism or it's in uh, allowing people maximum expression, uh, and, and as Arab Israelis, as Palestinian Israelis, and being extremely tolerant of differences. But in the end, what it did was uh, it empowered people who want to uh, annihilate Israel and replace it with something else. Um, you, you did just mention one thing that I want to go back and ask you about because it, it also just gets in, and and we'll talk about that more in a second. But one of one of the things what I just said we can I want you to respond. But you said a couple of things uh, when you were introducing the problem that I'm not really clear on. Particularly, you talk about um, you said you need you need uh, motivation, which they have. You need an organization. Um, and so I had a couple of questions, both about the organizational frameworks and also about the killing. Um, so regarding the organizational frameworks, I'm not really clear what you mean when you say that they're using the tribal frameworks. I mean, there are a lot of different frameworks in Arab Israeli society. There are tribes. I think that they're much more, um, they're much more uh, powerful uh, social forces among Bedouins in the Negev than among the city dwellers in the in the Galilee, and and I'd like you to correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I want to understand the privacy of them. When you look at other organizational uh, constructs, you have the uh, you have all kinds of the higher committee of Vadat uh, Makav. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's it's the uh, the 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 uh, follow up commit higher committee of Arab Israelis that they play a role. You have all of these Western funded uh, NGOs, Arab NGOs um, uh, that uh, are involved in undermining the uh, work of the state, the enforcement of law towards Arab Israelis by Israeli authorities. Um, but you, and then, and so I want to talk about, so I'm trying to understand the organizational framework. And then I also have a question about the killing. But if you can just first explain really, and, and of course, then you have the Arab political organizations. You have all the various political parties that are represented in, in local politics and that are represented uh, in national politics. And you also have the intervention and the active involvement of Arab states. Um, and not to mention the Palestinians, which we obviously have to get into as well. Maybe that's in the killing part, but of Jordan, that's you know massively funding a lot of these uh, uh, of these uh, political parties and different organizations, and also Qatar, that's funding a lot of the of the irredentist operations of the 
of the of the uh, nationalistic and Islamic operations inside of Arab Israeli society. So just talk a little bit more about what we're looking at organizationally about the relationship also between the Hamulot and all of these outside organizations that <coughs> are much more easy for me to follow as an outsider. Uh, I think that your question is, is very good. And I think it's need a little bit more time than we have now to, to give a very uh, deep analysis of these uh, contradicting forces within the uh, uh, Arab Israeli society. But we have to remember what are the real uh, foundation of, uh, of the structure of this uh, society, and they're not <coughs> about to change. Uh, this is the, the family, the Hamula, uh, in its uh, broad meaning, not the nuclear uh, family, father, mother, and children, but it's the, uh, it's, uh, the family in its broad meaning and the tribe. Those are the most uh, fundamental uh, coordinates which make every Arab in general and the Israeli Arabs in specific, <coughs> uh, <coughs> those are the coordinates through which he uh, uh, defined himself. And also there is the territorial element, the land, uh, the, the, the village, uh, even when they move into some urban uh, uh, areas, they still keep it by names, by by mentality. Uh, we <clears throat> we don't we don't identify that very well, except as very very uh, you know uh, very uh, trained experts. But it's there. And by the way, one of the reasons where, where that we see the urban process in the Israeli Arab society so very slow, they still build their homes on their land with some, uh, with some olive trees around. And uh, they could have, the state of Israel could have made uh, the standard of living much higher and even easier and save a lot of land by building uh, uh, modern tall buildings, but they don't, when I was the Minister of uh, Housing and Construction, we offered <coughs> some of the villages which turn out to be small towns and cities uh, uh, a tall, uh, to build some tall buildings. Uh, there was a refusal uh, to buy apartments there, so we stopped it. But it's, this. Th those are the, those are the foundations of the of the society now what happened and of course above all this although the bedouins were a little bit of an exception about arabs in general uh it's the islamic uh islamic umbrella which in a way uh uh become again one more dimension of their <coughs> of the way they identified themselves. Now, what happened was very, very interesting because the Arab states uh, at the early 50s, 60s, until some at the 80s, they had, they in a way adapted a national, uh, Western national uh, uh, ideology. Uh, in Egypt, even in, uh, in Syria, in Iraq, some of it was uh, communist, some of this was socialist, but they adapted all kind of uh, uh, political thought and, 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 and used uh, political terminology, which was not their original terminology. And then what happened was it burst up of all these national states in Iran, in Iraq, in, in Syria, and the, the, the wake up and the emerge of forces which were very much committed to the uh, Islamic uh, dimension. Now, what happened here in, in amongst the, Palestinian, among the Israeli Palestinians 
was that they grew up under and nearby the political thought of Israel. And in a way, they, they, had, some, they had some feelings and they were educated in Haifa University or some other places that they need to use this terminology in order to be, uh, <clears throat> to be considered as modern people who their arguments can be heard. And now this conflict between their fundamental, original, natural uh, uh, coordinates, which identify them and between what have been imported through this kind of uh, uh, liberal revolution and the, the contact with liberal uh, uh, institutions that create now a, a kind of confusion and conflict within the uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, society. I predict that at the end of the day, uh, they will reject uh, all the uh, idea of democracy, all the idea of civil rights, which they already reject. They use it now because it's served for a great extent their arguments against the state of Israel, but amongst themselves, they don't respect civil uh, rights and civil uh, uh, liberal civil thought whatsoever. So I believe that radicalism amongst the Palestinians, Israeli Palestinians will go far and far. And it will, at the end, it will be dressed with the original Islamic fundamentalism and will join hands as it's already happened so, so intensively with the most radical Islamic uh, uh, forces around us. If we shall deal with that so softly and so tolerantly as we did so far, we will have Gaza in, uh, in, in, in Beersheba will be surrounded by Gazian uh, uh, environment. And uh, the same thing with the, with, with, with the Galilee. And uh, there are many signs that it's already, it's already happening. So Which all makes me want to go for let, let the, the political parties and the Vadat Makav and all these uh, institutions which were built in order to, uh, in order to uh, moderate the Islamic core of the Israeli Arabs uh, are about to fail at the end. To surrender, so I just to surrender to, the, uh, the, the Islamic uh, radicalism. I, I just want to go back to the killing thing because obviously um, that's kind of the tip of the iceberg for most Israelis when we see the violence, when we're, when we're watching it and watching it unfold. So there are a lot of things here. I mean, when you were talking about um, the anti-liberal, the uh, authoritarian mindset of the leadership of the Arab Israelis, so we're already seeing, and there have already been, you know, exposés of this that they're not turning to uh, not Israeli what? law enforcement when they have when they have a conflict when somebody carries out. A, uh, crime among Arabs that they're going more to their independent uh, justice. They have their own self-operating uh, court system that they've developed over time, particularly in the Negev, where they essentially reject Israelis' national uh, authorities. That they're not. That they were. I don't even know if it's a boycott. It's a choice to just opt out of the system. They build parallel justice systems in their own in their own villages, in their own tribes, and they're using them instead. So they're not, they're settling everything inside of their own, their own organizations. And then they also have, when you're talking about killing, I'm, I'm, but wait, and then, and then there's another level of that, which is that, you know, the, the left in Israel in particular has been limiting, and we see this very clearly with the, with the Bennett, Lapid, Gantz government, that they're constantly talking about bringing down the level of criminality 
among Israeli Arabs, and they never attribute to the criminality any nationalistic uh, angle, that they always look at it as, oh, you know, it's just these poor women who are being murdered in honor killings by their brothers or their fathers or their cousins, and they, and they never, they ignore and keep out of the discourse the question of what are you talking about when you're talking about criminal activity among Israeli Arabs. And then I just wanna add two more th observations that have been becoming very clear. One is, um, you know, we've had all of these sightings, all, like almost every day you see young Arab men walking around with t-shirts that have iron-ons, that have uh, the, uh, the insignia, a, a big M16, uh, on the back or on the front, and uh, and and people have uh, really taken issue with these young Arab men walking around with these T-shirts, and I'm wondering whether you think that this is a uniform or or a signal of some sort that they're part of the military organization that you hear training every night. Uh, and then the other question that I had was, yeah, you know we. The, for many, many years, many years, 15 years, if not more, we've had growing criminal syndicates of Arab Israelis, Bedouin Israelis, Arabs, uh, uh, villagers in the Galilee that are conducting mass sabotage of the, uh, of, uh, and, and um, extortion rings against Israeli farmers, burning crops, stealing livestock. On a whole scale basis, you have Israeli shopkeepers from one end of the country to the to the other who are compelled to pay protection to Arab gangs. You even have uh, uh, the Jewish National Fund that operates Israel's uh, forests in the south and in the north have been paying protection to these Arab criminal gangs who threaten to or burn down uh, parts of the forests and then say that they'll come in and, and provide security for the forest if national institutions of Israel will pay them protection. So we even have national institutions like the JNF paying protection to these criminal syndicates. What is the connection between them? So I've asked you three questions. I've asked whether you think that those M16 t-shirts are are, are uh, uh, some sort of a signal or a uniform. I, and then I've asked you the broader question about the, 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 the nexus yep. between the criminality and the militarism. And then I asked you a third question, which now I suddenly can't remember. So if you can just suffice with two, that would be good. I think that first, uh, uh, I would say that the way that the state of Israel uh, phrase and explain itself uh, what happened around uh, through- Oh yeah, the, the government, the government. That was the first the question was the, the way that we explain the, the problem to ourselves. The government, yes. and I would say the governments, uh, most of the governments in the last uh, three decades uh, were looking at this process uh, first with an unbelievable strategic, uh, uh, lack of strategic understanding. They, they really uh, wanted to tell themselves all kinds of false stories for a long time. Uh, the only way we can <clears throat> uh, justify or explain that blindness is first the astonishment. The astonishment from and the disappointment from the fail of the experiment. As you said, we were such a, a, a enlightened state that we allowed uh, people who were part of <clears throat> our enemies at the in independent war, at the first uh, steps of ourselves as a state, in the most bitter, crucial moments of our very existence, uh, overnight, uh, those who didn't run away, uh, we uh, hugged them and adopted them and invited them uh, and opened the doors as wide as can be uh, to them and offered them to be equal citizens. That was a very, uh, I would say, a very uh, courageous, noble uh, experiment. And Israel really did with, with, with whatever she had, you know, remember that we have uh, millions of immigrants during these years, 
and, and we shared with the Arabs and I invite everyone. I traveled yesterday amongst the uh, uh, Arab villages in the Galil, uh, Ilabun, uh, Dirhana, Sakhnin and Arabic. It's unbelievable. I mean, most of the people live in huge uh, villas, huge homes. The infrastructure is much better than in my, in my Moshav. The roads are good. The, the, the gardening is nice. And all this story of uh, them being uh, discriminated and uh, the unfair sharing of the, of the, of the state wealth, it's, it's a lie. It's a lie. And the disappointment and the feeling of, of that, 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 that we in a way were cheated by the, by the Arab minority and they turn us bad uh, for so many good things that we did. Uh, that, that was the first uh, gap between what the eyes and the ears heard and saw and what was the explanation. And that's not only left government, it's the Israeli political establishment in general that couldn't believe to that kind of uh, I think they were ungrateful, ingratitude. Yes. How? The, ingratitude. The, ingratitude. Ingratitude. They were ungrateful. Of, 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 uh, of, of those, of those uh, Israeli Arabs. And not only this gratitude, they became an irredential uh, minority. They join hands in every case with our enemies, uh, cl uh, close and far enemies, and adapted all the terminology the most radical uh, 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 Islamic, Islamic ideas. So that was one thing. The other thing is that more time passed, this kind of uh, Gordic, right? Gordic uh, connection ties, Gordian, 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 Gordian uh, tie became something that they didn't know how to untie, how to open, how to make that uh, operation and leave uh, the, the two parts uh, alive. So fear prevailed. Fear prevailed. It's a problem that we don't know how to deal with. We have no power. We have no legal frame to deal with that. Israeli citizens equal. And in a way, uh, a pessimism as far as the capability of the state of Israel effectively to deal with that uh, became something that almost every government, I was a minister in three governments, uh, uh, was Arik Sharon, but the but the idea that that this problem has got to be dealt in a as a strategic challenge uh, was never really uh, was was never really took uh, took place. On, on top of that was of course the uh, liberal ideology and the liberal Israeli Jewish political uh, forces which made it almost impossible to put first the facts and the problem on the table before dealing with what solutions must be or should be. There was, it, it became a taboo for every uh, a politician in Israel who wants not to be accused as a fascist, uh, don't deal with that. Don't mention the problem with Israeli Arabs, we will have to live with that. And really God knows what, what will happen and how we do that. And more and more the weight of this delegitimation within Israel itself. In the Knesset, all these speeches about wow, how, the, the, how criminal the Israeli army is, all the, all the claims for land, which was the the nation and state land as something that they own or should own or should get the support from the Supreme Court of Justice in so many, many cases. That, that's, 
and, and, and now we come to a moment of, of truth. And if we shall continue to deal with the question as a problem of criminality, uh, that will continue to, 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 to move forward under this cover. And at the end, we shall find, and we have already uh, uh, have an enemy with Israeli, uh, Israeli identity cards, with Israeli present as part of the Jewish state, Jewish people. And uh, in a way, uh, that, 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 that's something that needs so much courage. Even this interview, even this podcast, which I tell you what I think might be a kind of, a, a, uh, might, might be used against me and to continue a very long process of delegitimation, which I absorb. I'm very trained. I'm not. I don't. I'm. I'm, I'm not. I don't, I'm not afraid. But think about a politician. We just start now his first steps in politics, and he needs the media and the academy to legitimize him, to invite him to all kind of conferences, to interview him. Then he will use all kind of double, uh, double. Uh, uh, language. He will speak from both sides of his, his lips and he will maneuver and at the end he will not be able and so far that will happen to gather uh, the courage and the unity and the power which is needed to deal with existential problems as states sometime needs to face. You know, um... I mean, I, I think I think that uh, I think first of all, I think that I have to thank you. Because I don't hear you. I'm sorry. I said first of all, I, I want to thank you for speaking so candidly about this because I mean, and that's obviously why I had you on because um, you 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 know, and you're right. And one of just so you guys know, watching out there, uh, the reason one of the reasons I wanted uh, Effie on today was because I'm curious, I wanted to know what he has to say. I wanna understand what these uh, nighttime training sessions are because you, if you go on Google and in, in Hebrew, it's not even in English and you, and you and I put your name in and I say uh, Arab army, nothing comes up. And then, you know, like last week he, he gets on the news with the headline, the Arabs are training an army, the Israeli Arabs, but then as soon as you give the headline, they ask you about other stuff. And so I didn't actually, I mean, maybe I missed an interview or two, but I didn't see any detail about this incredibly terrifying concept that this is what's happening among our neighbors here in Israel. And we have to be aware of it. And I think that this is absolutely the most important thing. And, and, and you know, it, just to get the basis of what's going on with the Israeli Arabs, we've already spent most of the hour. So I want to just have a final question with you, which is about um, the elections. You know, now the central argument that the Likud and the right wing bloc are making against the left and that the left are sort of making against the right is whether we should have Arab Israeli parties in the next coalition government. And so the right wing is saying absolutely not. And Yair Lapid and Benny Gantz do not have a government without these very radical Arab parties. And then you see this maneuvering on the part of the left, Meretz, uh, who's, who's jockeying to raise the Arab voter turnout, and, um, and Yair Lapid. And, and it's not really clear what they're doing, but basically they, they split up the joint Arab list into two parties. You have Ram, the Muslim Brotherhood, that's already been running on its own since the last election. And now you have what was left of the consortium of three parties, They've broken into two blocks where you have Balad, which is sort of the Israeli Ba'athist party that's running on its own. That's controlled by Qatar through its former head, Azmi Bushara, who, who lives in Doha. And then you have the other two parties, which is sort of the PLO party led by Yasser Arafat's former advisor and the head of the Arab uh, Communist Party, which uh, uh, has called for Arabs to leave the police force and pure air dentism and, and Ayman Uda goes to the United States, speaks to American Jewish uh, communities about how terrible American Jewish support for Israel is and why Israel should be boycotted. So you have these three parties now running the Muslim Brotherhood, 
uh, the Baathist Party and the PLO Communist Party are running. Um, and the question is whether to have, an, have a government with the Islamic Brotherhood and the PLO uh, Communist Party in them or not. What, what were the, how do you look at this, uh, at what has happened as a result of the Muslim Brotherhood being a member of the outgoing government's coalition and uh, the prospect of seeing uh, the other Arab parties in a, in a new government to be formed after the elections? I think that for many, many years, actually, uh, maybe one exception with the Rabin government, minority government, which was supported by Arabs from the outside, by the way. Uh, they were not part of the coalition government. But for many, many years, no matter what the governments were, uh, uh, I mean, I don't speak about the radical left in Israel, but, <clears throat> but uh, all the other government, the uh, labor governments and the Likud government, uh, uh, always, uh, I mean, it was a kind of understanding that in order to maintain the, uh, uh, the Israeli Arabs, the Palestinian Arabs, in the Israeli political system as legitimate parties, they need to be kept out of the government. Uh, they can vote, they can be in the Knesset, but they cannot be part of the uh, ruling, uh, ruling uh, <coughs> coalition in Israel. That was exclusively, uh, uh, was exclusively, exclusively kept for Jewish, Zionist uh, uh, parties. They can be more left, they can be more right, but they are still under the definition of Zionist, Jewish Zionist parties. What happened, what, what, what happened with Bennett is not only that he spoiled and contaminated the idea of the democracy representing the will of the majority of the voters. Uh, they, they should be a limit even to the coalition manipulation that can hide behind the idea of this is the majority, uh, or, or the, the, the will of the majority. Of it. It's not, that, that's not the problem. The problem is that he first time opened the door for uh, uh, anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist, anti-Jewish Hamas party and brought them into the uh, uh, ruling system in Israel. That broke something so fundamental and so important. And that was a consensus among all the governments in Israel since it was established. And it was the only way People have to understand that was the only way to keep Arabs, Israeli Palestinians in the political system and not create a kind of a crisis that Israel will have to choose them or them in as a legitimate part of the ruling system in Israel. And that will bring Israel to become a state of all citizens by definition. It's not a matter of the numbers, it's by definition. It's not anymore the state of the Jewish people. Jewish people have no any advantage and Jewish will, Jewish... Uh, have not any more uh, uh, superiority over other uh, parts, uh, over other groups in the Israeli society. That became a kind of equality that is the heart and the soul of a state of all its citizens. That's what, what Bennett did, but he was so eager uh, uh, to, to fulfill his ego, uh, 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 his ego uh, dreams and desires that he was ready to destroy everything. That will be it's not by chance, I think, that now it's very clear that the Likud make it very clear. I think that uh, Benny Gantz also made it very clear that uh, uh, parties 
uh, Arab parties will not be part of, of, of the government. But it's, it's not a taboo anymore. It's not an obstacle that cannot be penetrated. And thanks to uh, Bennett, uh, that very destructive option uh, became, became real. Now, first what we need to do, and I think that Arabs, Israeli, Palestinians have to understand that if that uh, red line will not be redrawn and will not be put again as a real red line that cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be uh, 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 changed, crossed. although, cannot what? Cannot be crossed, yes. Right. Yes, although it's not a law, <coughs> although it's in something the Supreme Court of Justice might not agree, but that was de facto the smartness of the founding fathers after they made that tremendous mistake of bringing our enemies into the cradle of the, <coughs> of the moment of birth of the state uh, when, when Israel was established. But they created a kind of a modus operandi, a status quo, which made it, made it possible to run the day-to-day -day life of Israel by excluding uh, uh, Arab parties from being part of the ruling system. If that will not, if that will not redrone, there, there will be a deep crisis amongst the Israeli society as far as the legitimation of, of, of such kind of a government to declare a war, to, uh, uh, to, to, to take uh, uh, taxes, uh, and to make decisions which are uh, on the national level. So I think that the coming election are very important in, in um, <coughs> they're very important in many aspects, but in this aspect of redrawing and reshaping a ruling system in Israel, in other words, the coalition government, it can be from Mirav Michaeli to uh, to Bengvir, but it's this this element of Arab parties, anti-Zionist, anti-Israeli, uh, uh, can be uh, excluded out of this kind of uh, 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 coalition party potential. By the way, uh, it was again the Supreme Court of Justice who had. <coughs> to be the guard in the gate and not allow such kind of parties like, uh, like, like Balad and like uh, uh, Abbas party uh, uh, from participating in, 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 the, in the election because democracy should have limits and should have the right to defend the national uh, our character and the national nature of the state which a democracy functions in. And if it does not do that, if it does provide uh, power <coughs> to those who want to destroy this character of the, of the state, then democracy become a hollow uh, slogan, a hollow game. So for me, it's very important who will be the next prime minister. But for me, what was supposed to be obvious until the last election, until the last government, that whatever happened, we shall not surrender this pressure even to get some uh, uh, minor majority. We shall not surrender this pressure and bring in irredentic <coughs> elements which are not any more anonymous or come through a kind of a cover. They come with a flag <coughs> of destroying the state of Israel, the Jewish state, uh, uh, very high uh, in front of them. I agree. All right, well, Effie, I think we're gonna have to leave it at that because we're, we're running out of time. And I think that any, any further question that I ask you is just gonna end up having a, uh, uh, a discussion that's going to go out for another, you know, two or three hours so that we, we can't do this, but I, I will have you back and I want to talk specifically 
with you also about the other aspect, which I had been hoping to talk to Effie about today, which was um, uh, uh, how, why it is that uh, his appointment to be the uh, director of Yad Vashem was uh, undermined by the Israeli left. And I think it all, it's all very much part of the same uh, nexus of progressivism and Islamism that uh, he was talking about that you've been talking about in terms of Israeli Arabs and uh, that uh, that is a much broader subject um, uh, in terms of trying to hide or undermine or sabotage Israel's Jewish character and also the history of the Jewish people as it unfolded in, in Europe over the years and, and also in the Middle East. But that'll be for another day. And in the meantime, I just wanna thank you very much uh, for coming forward and, and telling us because obviously you know, uh, we all know that if we don't know what's happening, we're never going to be able to build policies uh, or strategies for survival that will work because you simply can't, <clears throat> you can't build anything based on uh, I, denial of the truth. We saw this, we continue to see this with the Palestinians and I, increasingly uh, we're having the same problem with Arab Israelis. So I thank you, and I want to wish you Chag uh, Sameach, Shana Tova. May the coming year really bring us uh, wisdom and uh, and courage uh, to handle very difficult uh, problems that we we're facing today. Thank you. I, thank I, you, Alfred. I agree, and just let me first uh, uh, recommend in front of uh, our audience uh, the book of Yoram Pazoni. I think that it's a very important book. And it's very important because what is written there, but because it's written in English and it's coming from America. And you know, <clears throat> uh, those ideas coming from America, the understanding that America collapse and America is losing its power from very uh, from, from, from the ideas which we have just discussed. In Israel, it has the Israeli specific face, but the ideas are not, are not only here. And they destroy national states, national armies, national motivation, national heritage all around. Europe is, 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 is almost non non-exist anymore. America is getting weaker and weaker. And by following what happened there in those two continents, we can understand that if we don't open our eyes and recruit courage, uh, first to say what the problem, and then to think about the strategy, then as you said, we might face uh, a, a catastrophe. And I want okay. to thank okay. you personally, being my friend, and Yoram Khazani being my friend, and for your uh, great contribution, raising such a wonderful, powerful, and courageous voice, while so many, many people are living in kind of uh, very well orchestrated and finance blindness and lies. Thank you, Shana Tova. So what we're seeing today, what what I think one of you know obviously the the picture that uh, that uh, Effie uh, Etan just just painted or demonstrated really by what's happening among Israeli Arabs and the unwillingness of Israelis to our our leaders our 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 elites to to acknowledge reality, let alone do anything about it. It it does go very clearly to what the central campaign issue is today as we go forward into the into the November 1st elections. And that is whether Israel is going to remain a Jewish state or whether it's going to become a post-Jewish state uh, that ends up being subsumed into an Arab nationalist uh, uh, narrative that rejects Jewish uh, rights to the land of Israel, Jewish history in the land of Israel, and the Jewish peoplehood and the Jewish people's existence and its right to self-determination. And in other words, whether they're going to be living in an Israel that is governed by the PLO charter, uh, or whether we're going to be governed by by uh, the Jewish people uh, on the basis of our, our laws. And here, I think this goes back to what he was talking about, the High Court of Justice in Israel and its role and the role of the legal fraternity uh, in, in enabling uh, 
this very dangerous phenomenon that we're seeing now reaching military proportions with, with the Arab-Israeli community to expand and really to, to explode in March of 2021 in the riots uh, and the pogroms that were carried out in concert with uh, Hamas and its missile offensive against Israel uh, in May of 2021. Um, because as he said, you know, under Israeli law, under Israeli law, cut, uh, political parties that reject Israel's right to exist and that support terrorism are not allowed to run for the Knesset for obvious reasons. You cannot give national authority for lawmaking to people who reject the right of the state to exist. It, it makes no sense and it's impossible. And this, by the way, I just want to say a sentence about the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration, uh, which paved the way for the League of Nations mandate and then for the establishment of the State of Israel uh, uh, in 1948, made very clear distinction. They said that the national rights to the land of Israel were reserved for the Jews and that all the other uh, residents of the land um, could receive full religious and civil rights, legal rights, uh, but that the right to determine the national character of the state belonged only to the Jews, that the Jews had a right to build our state in the land of Israel. And this is the legal basis uh, in international law still today for the existence of a Jewish state. Um, and, and of course, there's a historical basis, but just from an international legal perspective. And, and so that concept that only Jews have the right to national rights is also the basis of Israel's uh, legal structure. So when the Supreme Court overturned the Knesset's election committee's decision in previous uh, in previous iterations and enabled uh, Arabs, Arab parties that do not accept Israel's right to exist and that side with Israel's enemies uh, and their war to annihilate the Jewish state and to, to carry out terrorist uh, warfare against the state of Israel, uh, they undermined the very basis of the state of Israel, and the and they essentially annulled the the Balfour Declaration. Um, and uh, uh, so it was an illegal act by Israel's Supreme Court that they that they uh, that they breached Israel's own basic laws about the Knesset, and then uh, the 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 basic fundamental understanding of what it means to be a Jewish state by allowing these irredentist parties to take over. And then they seize the balance of power for reasons that have to do with the pathologies of, of, uh, of the left and uh, breakaway uh, members of, of right-wing parties like Gidon Saar and Naftali Bennett and Ayala Shaked, who refused to serve under Netanyahu, refused to accept the uh, judgment of Likud voters uh, that they want uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to be prime minister. And so that gave the Arab uh, parties that are illegal under Israeli law, but have been legalized unlawfully in breach of law by Israel's Supreme Court justices to participate in, in the uh, elections. Um, and this brings me to my final, what I where I wanted to go with my final statement, which is that, you know, um, I, I don't know what we do uh, in general. Uh, you know, we, if we face an insurrection uh, and an insurgency of Arab Israelis who have all the arms that they've smuggled in from Jordan and from Gaza and that they've stolen from IDF bases over the years, how this gets fought, what sort of uh, structure or unit structure in the IDF we need to build. Um, they've been talking about building a National Guard. What would that involve? Who would be in it? Um, that's a separate question that we can look at in a future uh, discussion with uh, with uh, with the military people who are working on this issue. But I believe that the first place that we have to start is reform reform of our legal system and the C the re reassertion of the power to determine Israel's laws to the lawmakers to the Knesset and to take it away from our our justices who have seized power that they have not gained from our lawmakers to dictate policy, dictate national policy, dictate what can be law, how we're supposed to interpret laws that are very clear that don't need interpretation, like the law that says that parties that reject Israel's right to exist and support our enemies aren't allowed to uh, run for office, run for the Knesset. Um, and I think, and, and also that what we're seeing now is a breakdown of the rule of law because of our legal 
our, 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 the leaders of our legal fraternity and the outsized power of the state prosecution and the justices of the Supreme Court that they've seized unlawfully from the Knesset and from the government. Um, and they've made a decision that law cannot be equally enforced towards Jews and Arabs, that Israel's legal, legal system is, uh, is siding with Arabs who seize government lands, build illegal structures on them saying that you know they have a right to keep that land that they've seized um, and that Israel can't enforce its laws about land seizure illegal uh, and illegal building towards the Bedouins in the south and the Arab uh, communities in, in the north uh, the same way that they enforce the laws towards Israeli Jews. And once we have proper enforcement of laws it's the same with the tax laws. It's a, so it and and hold and carrying uh, firearms unlawfully. I think that the way that you start to deal with a restive irredentist population that rejects Israel's right to exist, that is organizing itself as a separate political entity under our noses and building an army, as F.E.A. Tom has revealed, is to simply assert the power of the state not in a draconian way, but in the exact same way that the state asserts its power towards Israeli Jews. That is going to lead you in a direction. We have to understand that reality is always dynamic. And when you take an action that advances your uh, national interests, for instance, you apply Israeli law across the board entirely uh, exactly the same way towards Jews and Arabs, it puts you in a different position. And you're in that position and things have already changed. And then you have to look from the new position that you're in to try to figure out what you have to do next. And solutions appear. Once you start down that virtuous road of actually restoring your national authority towards your uh, Arab population, then you see that you've already begun to change things. And that's what the next government of Israel is going to be charged with doing. That's going to be one of its central tasks, is to begin the process. In fact, to enact the process, not to begin, it's too late in the game, but to actively enforce Israeli laws uh, uh, without, you know, without discrimination towards Jews and Arabs in this country equally. If that happens, then we're going to develop a new dynamic. And that new dynamic is gonna present us with new questions. If we have a government that is formed by Air Lapid and Benny Gantz, and I don't care what Benny Gantz or Gidon Saar says now when they're under stress, they have no option other than to form a government with the Arab parties. It's obvious, it's just the math. They don't have any ability to form a government without the Arabs. If they continue obviously to boycott uh, uh, Netanyahu and the Likud. Without, the Netan without Netanyahu and the Likud, they cannot form a government without the Arabs, and they will form a government with the Arabs. So the question is, who is going to form the next government? What is the next government going to look like? Is it going to be a government led by the Likud that's going to be controlled by the right-wing bloc, or is it going to be a government that is formed by Lapid and Gantz and rest on the support of these Arab parties that under Israeli law, forget about what the ruling of the justices was, under Israeli law are not allowed to be in the Knesset because they are enemies of the state of Israel and define themselves as such, then we are going to be eclipsed and we're going to be a state of all of its citizens. And Jews, uh, Effie wrongly used the term superiority. It's not superiority. Again, it goes back to the Balfour Declaration to the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, to our basic laws, is, and to the, the whole concept of Zionism, that Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Israel is the, is the expression of the success of the Zionist revolution. Its purpose is to ensure the Jewish people's sovereignty in our national homeland, which we are endowed with by our right to national self-determination and by our historic rights to this country, to this land. And the Balfour Declaration recognizes that. It says that 
the national rights to the land of Israel are reserved only for the Jewish people for the establishment of their nation state and all of the other citizens in the nation, in the state, in the nation state of the Jewish people have equal legal rights, equal religious rights, but not the right to national self-determination. Are we going to maintain that or are we going to lose it? Because you can't have it both ways. I disagree with one thing that, that Effie told us, which is that he, he apparently, perhaps in retrospect, thinks that Ben-Gurion's decision to give the uh, equal rights to Arab Israelis was wrong. That's not true. The reason why we've gotten into this pickle, yes, it's the nexus of Islamism and progressivism, absolutely, and our embarrassment at applying our national identity uh, as, as, uh, as we have our full rights to do, as we're, we're here in order to do uh, towards Arab Israelis. But if, if the progressives hadn't joined in, in an alliance with Islamists, and if the progressives hadn't then subverted the Israeli left from the outside and also from our academia, then, then we would have still not been in a problem here. And the only way not to be in this problem any longer is to stop giving, uh, giving unfair treatment, unfair uh, so-called affirmative action to Arabs and actually applying our law without discrimination towards Jews and Arabs. This is going to be the challenge of the next government if it's formed. And again, if a right-wing government under Netanyahu is not formed, then I, I don't see how we move on from here as a Jewish state. If you have another Israeli-Palestinian government leading this country, um, then our Jewish character um, is going to be sacrificed. Um, and, and that's really what's on, on the scales this time around. And, um, and we'll join you uh, for one more, one more show before Rosh Hashanah, but I'll still say in case you don't join in uh, next week, or we may put it out late this week, we'll have to see. Um, Rosh Hashanah, we'll say Shana Tova. And again, may the coming year be a year where we have the courage and we have the government capable of, of, of protecting this country and the courage to do what we need in order to secure our national survival as a Jewish state uh, for posterity. So thank you very much, Shana Tova, Metuka, and we'll see you later. Thank you.